The Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is pleased to present Poirot Investigates by Agatha Christie, read by David Suchet. This collection of 11 mysteries is complete and unabridged, an audio edition's mystery master. The Disappearance of Mr. Davenheim Poirot and I were expecting our old friend Inspector Jaff of Scotland Yard to tea. We were sitting round the tea table awaiting his arrival. Poirot had just finished carefully straightening the cups and saucers which our landlady was in the habit of throwing rather than placing on the table. He had also breathed heavily on the metal teapot and polished it with a silk handkerchief. The kettle was on the boil, and a small enamel saucepan beside it contained some thick, sweet chocolate, which was more to Poirot's palate than what he described as your English poison. A sharp rat-tat sounded below, and a few minutes afterwards Jap entered briskly. "'Hope I'm not late,' he said as he greeted us. "'To tell the truth, I was yawning with Miller, the man who's in charge of the Davenheim case.' I pricked up my ears. For the last three days the papers had been full of the strange disappearance of Mr. Davenheim, senior partner of Davenheim and Salmon, the well-known bankers and financiers. On Saturday last he'd walked out of his house and had never been seen since. I looked forward to extracting some interesting details from Jap. Look, I, I should have thought, I remarked, that it would be almost impossible for anyone to disappear nowadays. Poirot moved a plate of bread and butter, the eighth of an inch, and said sharply, uh, Be exact, my friend. What do you mean by disappear? To which class of disappearance are you referring? <laughs> are disappearances classified and labelled, then? I laughed. Jap smiled also. Poirot frowned at both of us. But certainly they are. They fall into three categories. First, and most common, the voluntary disappearance. Second, the much-abused loss-of-memory case, rare but occasionally genuine. Third, murder, and the more or less successful disposal of the body. Do you refer to all three as impossible of execution? Well, very nearly so, I should think. You might lose your own memory, but someone would be sure to recognize you, especially in the case of a well-known man like Davenheim. Then bodies can't be made to vanish into thin air. Sooner or later they turn up concealed in lonely places or in trunks. Murder will out. In the same way, the absconding clerk or the domestic defaulter is bound to be run down in these days of wireless telegraphy. He can be headed off from foreign countries, ports and railway stations are watched, and as for concealment in this country, his features and appearance will be known to everyone who reads a daily newspaper. He's up against civilization. Oh, mon ami, said Poirot, you make one error. You do not allow for the fact that the man who had decided to make away with another man, or with himself in a figurative sense, might be that rare machine, eh? a man of method. He might bring intelligence, talent, a careful calculation of detail to the task. And then I do not see why he should not be successful in baffling the police force. <laughs> but not you, I suppose said Jap good-humouredly, winking at me. He couldn't baffle you, eh, Monsieur Poirot? Poirot endeavoured, with a marked lack of success, to look modest. Me? Also, why not? It is true that I approach such problems with an exact science, a mathematical precision which seems, alas, only too rare in the new generation of detectives. Jap grinned more widely. Oh, I don't know, he said. Miller, the man who's on this case, is a smart chap. You may be very sure he won't overlook a footprint or a cigar ash or a crumb, even. He's got eyes that see everything. So, mon ami, said Poirot, has the London sparrow. But, all the same, I should not ask the little brown bird to solve the problem of Mr. Davenheim. Come now, monsieur. You're not going to run down the value of details as clues? Oh, by no means. These things are all good in their way. The danger is they may assume undue importance. Most details are insignificant. One or two are vital. It is the brain, the little grey cells, 
He tapped his forehead. On which one must rely. The senses mislead. One must seek the truth within, not without. Now you don't mean to say, Monsieur Poirot, that you would undertake to solve a case without moving from your chair, do you? <laughs> that is exactly what I do mean. Granted the facts were placed before me, I regard myself as a consulting specialist. Jap slapped his knee. Well, hanged if I don't take you at your word. Bet you a fiver you can't lay a hand, or rather tell me where to lay my hand on Mr. Davenheim, dead or alive, before a week is out. Poirot considered. Eh bien, mon ami, I accept. Le sport, it is the passion of you English. <laughs> now, the facts. <clears throat> well, on Saturday last... As is his usual custom, Mr. Davenheim took the 12.40 train from Victoria to Chingside, where his palatial country seat, the Cedars, is situated. After lunch, he strolled round the grounds and gave various directions to the gardeners. Now, everybody agrees that his manner was absolutely normal and as usual. After tea, he put his head into his wife's boudoir, saying that he was going to stroll down to the village and post some letters. He added that he was expecting a Mr. Lowen on business. If he should come before he himself returned, he was to be shown into the study and asked to wait. Mr. Davenheim then left the house by the front door, passed leisurely down the drive and out at the gate, and was never seen again. From that hour, he vanished completely. Hmm, pretty, eh? very pretty. Altogether, a charming little problem, murmured Poirot. Proceed, my good friend. About a quarter of an hour later, a tall, dark man with a thick black moustache rang the front doorbell and explained that he had an appointment with Mr. Davenheim. He gave the name of Lowen and, in accordance with the banker's instructions, was shown into the study. Nearly an hour passed. Mr. Davenheim did not return. Finally, Mr. Lowen rang the bell and explained that he was unable to wait any longer as he must catch his train back to town. Mrs. Davenheim apologised for her husband's absence, which seemed unaccountable, as she knew him to have been expecting the visitor. Mr. Lowen reiterated his regrets and took his departure. Well, as everyone knows, Mr. Davenheim did not return. Early on Sunday morning the police were communicated with, but could make neither head nor tail of the matter. Mr. Davenheim seemed literally to have vanished into thin air. He had not been to the post office, nor had he been seen passing through the village. At the station they were positive he had not departed by any train. His own motor had not left the garage. If he had hired a car to meet him in some lonely spot, it seems almost certain that by this time, in view of the large reward offered for information, the driver of it would have come forward to tell what he knew. Not true, there was a small race meeting at Entfield, five miles away, and if he had walked to that station he might have passed unnoticed in the crowd, but since then his photograph and a full description of him have been circulated in every newspaper, and nobody's been able to give any news of him. Now, we have, of course, received many letters from all over England, but each clue, so far, has ended in disappointment. On Monday morning, a further sensational discovery came to light. Behind a portiere in Mr. Davenheim's study stands a safe, and that safe had been broken into and rifled. The windows were fastened securely on the inside, which seems to put an ordinary burglary out of court, unless, of course, an accomplice within the house fastened them again afterwards. On the other hand, Sunday having intervened and the household being in a state of chaos, it's likely that the burglary was committed on the Saturday and remained undetected until Monday. Ah, précisément, said Poirot dryly. Well... Is he arrested, ce pauvre Monsieur Lowen? Jap grinned. Uh, not yet, but he's under pretty close supervision. Poirot nodded. What was taken from the safe? Have you any idea? We've been going into that with the junior partner of the firm and Mrs. Davenheim. Apparently there was a considerable amount in bearer bonds and a very large sum in notes, owing to some large transaction having been just carried through. There was also a small fortune in jewellery. All Mrs. Davenheim's jewels were kept in the safe. The purchasing of them had been a passion with her husband of late years, 
and hardly a month passed that he didn't make her a present of some rare and costly gem. Mm, altogether a good hole, said Poirot thoughtfully. Now, what about Loen? Hmm? Is it known what his business was with Davenheim that evening? Well, the two men were apparently not on very good terms. Loen is a speculator in quite a small way. Nevertheless, he's been able once or twice to score a coup off Davenheim in the market. <laughs> well, though it seems they seldom or never actually met. It was a matter concerning some South American shares which led the banker to make his appointment. Had Davenheim interests in South America, then? I believe so. Mrs. Davenheim happened to mention that he spent all last autumn in Buenos Aires. Any trouble in his own life? I mean, were the husband and wife on good terms? Oh, I should say his domestic life was quite peaceful and uneventful. Mrs. Davenheim is a pleasant, rather unintelligent woman. Well, quite a non-entity, I think. Oh, uh, then we must not look for the solution of the mystery there. Had he any enemies? Well, he had plenty of financial rivals, and no doubt there are many people, whom he has got the better of, who bear him no particular goodwill. But there was no one likely to make away with him, and if they had, well, where's his body? Exactly. As Hastings says, bodies have a habit of coming to light with fatal persistency. Oh, and by the way, one of the gardeners says he saw a figure going around to the side of the house towards the rose garden. The long French window of the study opens onto the rose garden, and Mr. Davenheim frequently entered and left the house that way. But the gardener was a good way off, at work on some cucumber frames, and cannot even say whether it was the figure of his master or not. Also, he cannot fix the time with any accuracy. It must have been before six, as the gardeners ceased to work at that time. And Mr. Davenham left the house? Oh, about half past five or thereabouts. Oh. What lies beyond the rose garden? A lake with a boat house? Yes, a couple of punts are kept there. I suppose you're thinking of suicide, Monsieur Poirot. Eh? Well, I don't mind telling you that Miller's going down tomorrow expressly to see that piece of water dragged. Or oh, that's the kind of man he is. Poirot smiled faintly and turned to me. Hastings, I pray you, hand me that copy of Daily Megaphone. If I remember rightly, there is an unusually clear photograph there of the missing man. I rose and found the sheet required, and Poirot studied the features attentively. Hmm, he murmured. Well, his hair rather long and wavy, huh? full moustache and pointed beard and, and bushy eyebrows. Eyes dark? Yes. Hmm. Hair and beard turning grey? The detective nodded. Well, Monsieur Poirot, what have you got to say to it all, then? Clear as daylight, eh? <laughs> On the contrary, most obscure. The Scotland Yard man looked pleased. Which gives me great hopes of solving it, <laughs> finished Poirot placidly. Eh? No, oh, I find it a good sign when the case is obscure. If a thing is clear as daylight, <laughs> eh bien, mistrust it. Someone has made it so. Chap shook his head almost pityingly. Well, each to their fancy, but it's not a bad thing to see your way clear ahead. I do not see, murmured Poirot. I shut my eyes and think. Chap sighed. Well, you've got a clear week to think in. And you will bring me any fresh developments that arise, eh? The results of the labours of the hard-working and lynx-eyed Inspector Miller, for instance? Oh, certainly. That's in the bargain. Seems a shame, doesn't it? Said Jap to me as I accompanied him to the door. It's like robbing a child. I could not help agreeing with a smile. No, I was still smiling as I re-entered the room. Eh bien, said Poirot immediately. You make fun of Papa Poirot. Is it not so? He shook his finger at me. You do not trust his grey cells, eh? Ah, and do not be confused. Let us discuss this little problem, incomplete as yet, I admit, but already showing one or two points of interest. The lake, I said significantly. And even more than the lake, the boathouse. I looked sideways at Poirot. He was smiling in his most inscrutable fashion. I felt that for the moment it would be quite useless to question him further. We heard nothing of Jap until the following evening, when he walked in at about nine o'clock. 
I saw at once by his expression that he was bursting with news of some kind. Eh bien, my friend, remarked Poirot, all goes well. Oh, but do not tell me that you have discovered the body of Mr. Davenheim in your lake, because I shall not believe you. Oh, no, we haven't found the body, but we did find his clothes. The identical clothes he was wearing that day. Mm, what do you say to that? Any other clothes missing from the house? No, his valet was quite positive on that point. The rest of his wardrobe is intact. There's more. We've arrested Lowen. One of the maids whose business it is to fasten the bedroom windows declares that she saw Lowen coming towards the study through the rose garden about a quarter past six. That would be about ten minutes before he left the house. And what does he himself say to that? Denied, first of all, that he'd ever left the study. But the maid was positive. And he pretended afterwards that he'd forgotten just stepping out of the window to examine an unusual species of rose. <laughs> it's rather a weak story, hmm? And there's fresh evidence against him has come to light. Mr. Davenheim always wore a thick gold ring, set with a solitaire diamond on the little finger of his right hand. Well, that ring was pawned in London on Saturday night by a man called Billy Kellett. Now, he's already known to the police, did three months last autumn for lifting an old gentleman's watch. Now, it seems he tried to pawn the ring at no less than five different places. Succeeded at the last one, got gloriously drunk on the proceeds, assaulted a policeman, and was run in. In consequence, I went to Bow Street with Miller and saw him. He's sober enough now, and I don't mind admitting we pretty well frightened the life out of him, hinting he might be charged with murder. Mm -hmm. Well, this is his yarn, and a very queer one it is. He was at Entfield Races on Saturday. Though I dare say scarf pins was his line of business rather than betting. Anyway, he had a bad day and was down on his luck. He was tramping along the road to Chingside and sat down in a ditch to rest just before he got into the village. A few minutes later, he noticed a man coming along the road to the village. Dark complexion gent, hmm, with a big moustache. One of them city toffs, is his description of the man. Callet was half concealed from the road by a heap of stones. And just before he got abreast of him, the man looked quickly up and down the road, and seeing it apparently deserted, he took a small object from his pocket and threw it over the hedge. Then he went on towards the station. Now, the object he'd thrown over the hedge had fallen with a slight chink, which aroused the curiosity of the human derelict in the ditch. He investigated and, after a short search, discovered the ring. Well, that's Kellett's story. Now, it's only fair to say that Lowen denies it utterly, and, of course, the word of a man like Kellett can't be relied upon in the slightest. It's within the bounds of possibility that he met Davenheim in the lane and robbed and murdered him. Poirot shook his head. Mm. Very improbable, mon ami. He had no means of disposing of the body. It would have been found by now. Secondly, the open way in which he pawned the ring makes it unlikely that he did murder to get it. Thirdly, your sneak thief is really a murderer. Fourthly, as he has been in prison since Saturday, it would be too much of a coincidence that he is able to give so accurate a description of Lowen. Jap nodded. Why, well, I don't say you're not right, but all the same, you won't get a jury to take much note of a jailbird's evidence. What seems odd to me is that Lowen couldn't find a cleverer way of disposing of the ring. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. Well, after all... If it were found in the neighbourhood, it might be argued that Davenheim himself had dropped it. Yes, well, why remove it from the body at all? I cried. Well, there might be a reason for that, said Jack. Do you know that just beyond the lake a little gate leads out onto the hill, and not three minutes' walk brings you to, uh, what do you think, eh? A lime kiln. Good heavens, I cried. You mean that the lime which destroyed the body would be powerless to affect the metal of the ring? Exactly. Oh, it seems to me, I said, that that explains everything. What a horrible crime. By common consent, we both turned and looked at Poirot. He seemed lost in reflection, his brow knitted as though with some supreme mental effort. I felt at last his keen intellect was asserting itself. What would his first words be? We were not long left in doubt. With a sigh, the tension of his attitude relaxed, and turning to Jap, he asked, Have you any idea, my friend, whether Mr. and Mrs. Davenheim occupy the same bedroom? 
But the question seemed so ludicrously inappropriate that for a moment we both stared in silence. Then Jap burst into a laugh. Oh, good Lord, Monsieur Poirot, I thought you were coming out with something startling. As to your question, <laughs> well, I'm sure I don't know. You could find out, asked Poirot with curious persistence. But, uh, oh, so certainly, if you really want to know. Merci, mon ami. I should be obliged if you would make a point of it. Jap stared at him a few minutes longer, but Poirot seemed to have forgotten us both. The detective shook his head sadly at me, and murmuring, Poor old fellow, war's been too much for him, mm -hmm. gently withdrew from the room. As Poirot seemed sunk in a daydream, I took a sheet of paper and amused myself by scribbling notes upon it. My friend's voice aroused me. He had come out of his reverie and was looking brisk and alert. Que faites-vous là, mon ami? I was jotting down what occurred to me as the main points of interest in this affair. Ah, you become methodical at last said Poirot approvingly. I concealed my pleasure. Shall I read them to you? Oh, by all means. I cleared my throat. <clears> One. <throat> all the evidence points to Lowen having been the man who forced the safe. Two. He had a grudge against Avenheim. Three. He lied in his first statement that he had never left the study. Four. If you accept Billy Kellett's story as true, Lowen is unmistakably implicated. I paused. Well, I asked, for I felt that I'd put my finger on all the vital facts. Poirot looked at me pityingly, shaking his head very gently. Oh, mon pauvre ami, but it is that you have not a gift. The important detail, you appreciate him never. Also, your reasoning is false. Well, how? Let me take your four points. Hmm? One. Mr. Lowen could not possibly know that he would have the chance to open the safe. He came for a business interview. He could not know beforehand that Mr. Davenheim would be absent, posting a letter, and that he would consequently be alone in the study. Well, he might have seized the opportunity, I suggested. And the tools? City gentlemen do not carry around housebreaker's tools on the off chance, and one could not cut into that safe with a penknife. Well, what about number two? You say Lowen had a grudge against Mr. Davenheim. What you mean is that he had once or twice got the better of him, and presumably these transactions were entered into with a view of benefiting himself. In any case, you do not as a rule bear a grudge against a man you have got the better of. It is more likely to be the other way about. Whatever grudge there might have been would have been on Mr. Davenheim's side. Well, you can't deny that he lied about never having left the study. No. But he may have been frightened. Remember, the missing man's clothes had just been discovered in the lake. Of course, as usual, he would have done better to speak the truth. And the fourth point? No, I grant you that. If Kellett's story is true, Lowen is undeniably implicated. That is what makes the affair so very interesting. Well, then I did appreciate one vital fact. Hmm, perhaps, but you have entirely overlooked the two most important points, the ones which undoubtedly hold the clue to the whole matter. And, pray, what are they? One, the passion which has grown upon Mr. Davenheim in the last few years for buying jewellery. Two, his trip to Buenos Aires last autumn. Poirot, you are joking. No, I am serious. Ah, sacred thunder, but I hope Jap will not forget my little commission. But the detective, entering into the spirit of the joke, had remembered it so well that a telegram was handed to Poirot about eleven o'clock the next day. At his request, I opened it and read it out. Husband and wife have occupied separate rooms since last winter. Aha! cried Poirot. And now we are in mid-June. <laughs> All is solved. I stared at him. You have no monies in the bank of Davenheim and Salmon, mon ami? No, I said, wondering. Why? Because I should advise you to withdraw it before it is too late. Well, why? What do you expect? I expect a big smash in a few days, perhaps sooner. Oh, which reminds me, we will return the compliment of a depeche to Jap. 
a pencil I pray you and a form. Voila. Advise you to withdraw any money deposited with firm in question. Ah. That will intrigue him, the good japper. His eyes will open wide, wide. He will not comprehend in the slightest until tomorrow or the next day. I remained sceptical, but tomorrow forced me to render tribute to my friend's remarkable powers. In every paper was a huge headline telling of the sensational failure of the Davenheim Bank. The disappearance of the famous financier took on a totally different aspect in the light of the revelation of the financial affairs of the bank. Before we were halfway through breakfast, the door flew open and Jap rushed in. In his left hand was a paper. In his right was Poirot's telegram, which he banged down on the table in front of my friend. How did you know, Monsieur Poirot? How the blazes could you know? Poirot smiled placidly at him. Ah, mon ami, after your wire, it was a certainty. From the commencement, see you, it struck me that the safe burglary was somewhat remarkable. Jewels, ready money, bearer bonds, all so conveniently arranged for whom? <laughs> well, the good Monsieur Davenheim was of those who look after number one, as your saying goes. It seemed almost certain that it was arranged for himself. And then his passion of late years for buying jewelry, huh? How simple. The funds he embezzled, he converted into jewels, very likely replacing them in turn with paste duplicates. And so he put away in a safe place under another name a considerable fortune to be enjoyed all in good time when everyone has been thrown off the track. His arrangements completed, he makes an appointment with Mr. Lowen who has been imprudent enough in the past to cross the great man once or twice. He drills a hole in the safe, leaves orders that the guest is to be shown into the study, and walks out of the house. Where? Poirot stopped and stretched out his hand for another boiled egg. He frowned. It is really insupportable, he murmured, that every hen lays an egg of a different size. What symmetry can there be on the breakfast table? Huh? At least they should sort them in dozens at the shop. Oh, never mind the eggs, said Jap impatiently. Let them lay them square if they like. Tell us where our customer went to when he left the cedars. That is, if you know. Eh bien, he went to his hiding place. Ah, this Monsieur Davenheim. There may be some malformation in his grey cells, <laughs> but they are of the first quality. Well, do you know where he's hiding? Oh, certainly. It is most ingenious. Well, for the Lord's sake, tell us then. Poirot gently collected every fragment of shell from his plate, placed them in the egg cup and reversed the empty eggshell on top of them. This little operation concluded, he smiled on the neat effect and then beamed affectionately on both of us. Oh, come, my friends. You are men of intelligence. Ask yourself the question I asked myself. If I were this man... Where should I hide? Hastings, what do you say? Well, I said, I am rather inclined to think I'd not do a bolt at all. I'd stay in London, in the heart of things, travel by tubes and buses. Ten to one I'd never be recognised, or there's safety in a crowd. Poirot turned inquiringly to Jab. No, 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 I don't agree. No, get clear away at once. That's the only chance. I would have had plenty of time to prepare things beforehand. I'd have a yacht waiting with steam up, and I'd be off to one of the most out-of-the-way corners of the world before the hue and cry began. We both looked at Poirot. What do you say, monsieur? For a moment he remained silent. Then a very curious smile flitted across his face. My friends, if I were hiding from the police, do you know where I should hide? In a prison. What? You are seeking Monsieur Davenheim in order to put him in prison, so you never dream of looking to see if he may not be already there. Well, what do you mean? You tell me Madame Davenheim is not a very intelligent woman. Nevertheless, I think if you took her up to Bow Street and confronted her with a man, Billy Kellett, 
she would recognize him, in spite of the fact that he has shaved his beard and mustache and those bushy eyebrows, and has cropped his hair close. A woman nearly always knows her husband, though the rest of the world may be deceived. Well, Billy Kellett? But he's known to the police! Did I not tell you Davenheim was a clever man? He prepared his alibi long beforehand. He was not in Buenos Aires last autumn. He was creating the character of Billy Kellett, doing three months, so that the police should have no suspicions when the time came. He was playing, remember, for a large fortune as well as liberty. It was worthwhile doing the things thoroughly, only... Yes? Eh bien, afterwards he had to wear a false beard and wig had to make up as himself again, and to sleep with a false beard is not easy. It invites detection. He cannot risk continuing to share the chamber of Madame his wife. Now, you found out for me that for the last six months, or ever since his supposed return from Buenos Aires, he and Mrs. Davenheim occupied separate rooms. Then I was sure... Everything fitted in. The gardener, who fancied he saw his master going round to the side of the house, was quite right. He went to the boathouse, donned his tramp clothes, which you may be sure had been safely hidden from the eyes of his valet, dropped the others in the lake, and proceeded to carry out his plan by pawning the ring in an obvious manner, and then assaulting a policeman, getting himself safely into the haven of Bow Street, where nobody would ever dream of looking for him. It's impossible, murmured Jap. Ask madame, said my friend, smiling. The next day, a registered letter lay beside Poirot's plate. He opened it, and a five-pound note fluttered out. My friend's brow puckered. Ah, sacré! But what shall I do with it? Eh? I have much remorse. So pauvre Jap. Oh, ah, an idea! We will have a little dinner, we three. That consoles me. It was really too easy. I am ashamed. I, who would not rob a child? Huh? Uh, Milton Air, mon ami, what have you that you laugh so heartily? The Jewel Robbery at the Grand Metropolitan Poirot, I said, a change of air would do you good. Oh, you think so, mon ami? I am sure of it. Eh? Eh? said my friend, smiling. It is all arranged, then. Will you come? Where do you propose to take me? Brighton. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine in the city put me onto a very good thing, and, well, I have money to burn, as the saying goes. Now, I think a weekend at the Grand Metropolitan would do us all the good in the world. Well, thank you. I accept most gratefully. You have the good heart to think of an old man, and the good heart, it is, in the end, worth all the little grass cells. <laughs> yes, yes, I who speak to you am in danger of forgetting that sometimes. I did not relish the implication. I fancy that Poirot is sometimes a little inclined to underestimate my mental capacities, but his pleasure was so evident that I put my slight annoyance aside. Then that's all right, I said hastily. Saturday evening saw us dining at the Grand Metropolitan in the midst of a jolly throng. All the world and his wife seemed to be at Brighton. The dresses were marvellous, and the jewels, worn sometimes with more love of display than good taste, were something magnificent. Ah, it is a good sight, this, murmured Poirot. This is the home of the profiteer, is it not so, Estings? No, well, supposed to be, I replied. But we'll hope they aren't all tarred with the profiteering brush. <laughs> Poirot gazed around him placidly. You know, the sight of so many jewels makes me wish I had turned my brains to crime instead of to its detection. What a magnificent opportunity for some thief of distinction, eh? Regard, Estings, that stout woman by the pillar. She is, as you would say, plastered with gems. I followed his eyes. Why? I exclaimed. It's Mrs. Oppelson. You know her? No, oh, slightly. Her husband is a rich stockbroker who made a fortune in the recent oil boom. After dinner, 
We ran across the Oppelsons in the lounge, and I introduced Poirot to them. We chatted for a few minutes and ended by having our coffee together. Poirot said a few words in praise of some of the costlier gems displayed on the lady's ample bosom, and she brightened up at once. Oh, it's a perfect hobby of mine, Monsieur Poirot. I just love jewellery. Ed knows my weakness, and every time things go well, he brings me something new. Uh, you are interested in precious stones? Well, I have had a good deal to do with them one time and another, madame. My profession has brought me into contact with some of the most famous jewels in the world. He went on to narrate with discreet pseudonyms the story of the historic jewels of a reigning house, and Mrs. Oppelson listened with bated breath. Oh, there now, she exclaimed as he ended, if it isn't just like a play. You know, I've got some pearls of my own that have a history attached to them. I believe it's supposed to be one of the finest necklaces in the world. The pearls are so beautifully matched and so perfect in colour. I declare I really must run up and get it. Oh, madame, protested Poirot, you are too amiable. Pray do not derange yourself. Oh, but I'd like to show it to you. The buxom dame waddled across to the lift briskly enough. Her husband, who had been talking to me, looked at Poirot inquiringly. Madame, your wife is so amiable as to insist on showing me her pearl necklace, explained the latter. Oh, the pearl. Oppelson smiled in a satisfied fashion. Well, they are worth seeing. Cost a pretty penny, too. Still, the money's there, all right. I could get what I paid for them any day. Well, perhaps more. Oh, may have to, too, if things go on as they are now. Money's confoundedly tight in the city. All this infernal EPD, he rambled on, launching into technicalities where I could not follow him. He was interrupted by a small page-boy who approached and murmured something in his ear. Eh, what, what? Oh, well, well, yes, I'll come at once. Oh, not taken ill, is she? Mm, excuse me, gentlemen. He left us abruptly. Poirot leaned back and lit one of his tiny Russian cigarettes. Then, carefully and meticulously, he arranged the empty coffee cups in a neat row and beamed happily on the result. The minutes passed. The Oppelsons did not return. Curious, I remarked at length. I wonder when they will come back. Poirot watched the ascending spirals of smoke and then said thoughtfully, They will not come back. Oh, why? Because, my friend, something has happened. Well, what sort of thing? How, how, how do you know? I asked curiously. Poirot smiled. A few minutes ago, the manager came hurriedly out of his office and ran upstairs. Now, he was much agitated. The lift boy is deep in talk with one of the pages. The lift bell has rung three times, but he heeds it not. Thirdly, even the waiters are distray. And to make a waiter distray? <clears throat> Poirot shook his head with an air of finality. The affair must indeed be of the first magnitude. Ah, uh -huh. it is as I thought. Here come the police. Two men had just entered the hotel, one in uniform, the other in plain clothes. They spoke to a page and were immediately ushered upstairs. A few minutes later, the same boy descended and came up to where we were sitting. Mr. Opperson's compliments, and would you step upstairs? Poirot sprang nimbly to his feet. One would have said that he awaited the summons. I followed with no less alacrity. The Oppersons' apartments were situated on the first floor. After knocking on the door, the page-boy retired, and we answered the summons. Come in. A strange scene met our eyes. The room was Mrs. Oppelson's bedroom, and in the centre of it, lying back in an armchair, was the lady herself, weeping violently. She presented an extraordinary spectacle with the tears making great furrows in the powder with which her complexion was liberally coated. Mr. Oppelson was striding up and down angrily. The two police officials stood in the middle of the room, one with a notebook in hand. A hotel chambermaid, looking frightened to death, stood by the fireplace, and on the other side of the room, a Frenchwoman, obviously Mrs. Oppelson's maid, 
was weeping and wringing her hands with an intensity of grief that rivalled that of her mistress. Into this pandemonium stepped Poirot, neat and smiling. Immediately, with an energy surprising in one of her bulk, Mrs. Obelson sprang from her chair towards him. There now, Ed may say what he likes, but I believe in luck, I do. It was fated I should meet you the way I did this evening, and I've a feeling that if you can't get my pearls back for me, nobody can. Now calm yourself, I pray of you, madame. Poirot patted her hand soothingly. Reassure yourself, all will be well. Hercule Poirot will aid you. Mr. Oppelson turned to the police inspector. Uh, there'll be no objection to my uh, calling in this gentleman, I suppose? Ah, uh, none at all, sir, replied the man civilly, but with complete indifference. Uh, perhaps now your lady's feeling better, she'll just let us have the facts. Mrs. Oppelson looked helplessly at Poirot. He led her back to her chair. Now seat yourself, madame, and recount to us the whole history without agitating yourself. Thus abjured, Mrs. Alpelson dried her eyes gingerly and began. Oh, uh, I, I came upstairs after dinner to fetch my pearls for Mr. Poirot here to see. The chambermaid and Celestine were both in the room as usual. Uh, excuse me, madame, but what do you mean by as usual? Mr. Oppelson explained. Well, um, I make it a rule that no one is to come into this room unless Celestine, the maid, is there also. The chambermaid does the room in the morning while Celestine is present and comes in after dinner to turn down the beds under the same conditions. Otherwise, she never enters the room. Well, as I was saying, continued Mrs. Oppelson, I, I came up, I, I went to the drawer here, she indicated the bottom right-hand drawer of the knee-hole dressing table, took out my jewel case and unlocked it. It seemed quite as usual, but the pearls were not there. The inspector had been busy with his notebook. Uh, when had you last seen them? he asked. Well, they were there when I went out to dinner. You're sure? Oh, quite sure. I was uncertain whether to wear them or not, but in the end I decided on the emeralds and put the pearls back in the jewel case. And who locked up the jewel case? I did. I wear the key on a chain round my neck. She held it up as she spoke. The inspector examined it and shrugged his shoulders. Oh, the thief must have had a duplicate key. Well, it was no difficult matter. The lock is quite a simple one. And now, what did you do after you'd locked the jewel case? I put it back in the bottom drawer where I always keep it. And you didn't lock the drawer? No, I, I never do. My maid remains in the room till I come up, so there's no need. The inspector's face grew greyer. So am I to understand that the jewels were there when you went down to dinner, and that since then the maid has not left the room? Suddenly, as though the horror of her own situation for the first time burst upon her, Celestine uttered a piercing shriek, and flinging herself upon Poirot, poured out a torrent of incoherent French. Oh, the suggestion was infamous, that she should be suspected of robbing Madame. The police were well known to be of a stupidity incredible, but Monsieur, who was a Frenchman... Uh, a Belgian, interjected Poirot. But Celestine paid no attention to the correction. Oh, Monsieur would not stand by and see her falsely accused, while that infamous chambermaid was allowed to go scot-free. Oh, she had never liked her. A bold, red-faced thing, a born thief. She had said from the first that she was not honest, and had kept a sharp watch over her, too, when she was doing Madame's room. Let those idiots of policemen such her, and if they did not find Madame's pearls on her, it would be very surprising. Although this harangue was uttered in rapid and virulent French, Celestine had interlarded it with a wealth of gesture, and the chambermaid realised at least a part of her meaning. She reddened angrily. Well, if that foreign woman's saying I took the pearls, it's a lie, she declared heatedly. I never so much as saw them. Ah, search her, screamed the other. You will find it as I say. Well, you're a liar, do you hear? said the chambermaid, advancing upon her. Stole them yourself and want to put it on me. Why, I was only in the room about three minutes before the lady came up and then you were sitting here the whole time as you always do, like a cat watching a mouse. The inspector looked across inquiringly at Celestine. Is that true? Didn't you leave the room at all? Well, I did not actually leave her alone, 
admitted Celestine reluctantly. But I went into my own room through the door here twice. Once to fetch a reel of cotton and once for my scissors. She must have done it then. <gasps> but you wasn't gone a minute, retorted the chambermaid angrily. Just popped out and in again. I'd be glad if the police would search me. I've got nothing to be afraid of. At this moment, there was a tap at the door. The inspector went to it. His face brightened when he saw who it was. Ah, he said. Oh, that was rather fortunate. I sent for one of our female searchers, and she's just arrived. Perhaps if you wouldn't mind going into the room next door? He looked at the chambermaid, who stepped across the threshold with a toss of her head. The searcher following her closely. The French girl had sunk sobbing into a chair. Poirot was looking around the room. Where does that door lead? he inquired, nodding his head toward the one by the window. I'm to the next apartment, I believe, said the inspector. It's bolted anyway on this side. Poirot walked across to it, tried it, then drew back the bolt and tried it again. And on the other side as well, he remarked. Well, that seems to rule out that. He walked over to the windows, examining each of them in turn. Ah, and again, nothing, not even a balcony outside. Well, even if there were, said the inspector impatiently, I don't see how that would help us, if the maid never left the room. Ah, évidemment, said Poirot, not disconcerted. As Mademoiselle is positive she did not leave the room. He was interrupted by the reappearance of the chambermaid and the police searcher. Nothing, said the latter, laconically. Well, I should hope not indeed, said the chambermaid virtuously. And that French hussy ought to be ashamed of herself taking away an honest girl's character. Now there, there, my girl, that's all right, said the inspector, opening the door. Nobody suspects you. You go along and get on with your work. The chambermaid went unwillingly. You're going to search her? she demanded, pointing at Celestine. Yes, yes. He shut the door on her and turned the key. Celestine accompanied the searcher into the small room in her turn. A few minutes later she also returned. Nothing had been found on her. The inspector's face grew graver. Ah, oh, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to come along with me all the same, miss. He turned to Mrs. Oppelson. I'm sorry, madam, but all the evidence points that way. If she's not got them on her, they are hidden somewhere about the room. Celestine uttered a piercing shriek and clung to Poirot's arm. The latter bent and whispered something in the girl's ear. She looked up at him doubtfully. Si, si, mon enfant, I assure you it is better not to resist. Then he turned to the inspector. You permit, monsieur? A little experiment, eh? purely for my own satisfaction. Well, depends on what it is, replied the police officer non-committedly. Poirot addressed Celestine once more. You have told us that you went into your room to fetch a reel of cotton. Eh? Now, whereabouts was it? On top of the chest of drawers, monsieur. And the scissors? Oh, they also. Now, would it be troubling you too much, mademoiselle, to ask you to repeat those two actions? You are sitting here with your work, you say? Celestine sat down, and then, at a sign from Poirot, rose, passed into the adjoining room, took up an object from the chest of drawers, and returned. Poirot divided his attention between her movements and a large turnip of a watch, which he held in the palm of his hand. Mm. Again, if you please, mademoiselle. At the conclusion of the second performance, he made a note in his pocketbook and returned the watch to his pocket. Thank you, mademoiselle. And you, monsieur, he bowed to the inspector, for your courtesy. The inspector seemed somewhat entertained by this excessive politeness. Celestine departed in a flood of tears, accompanied by the woman and the plain clothes official. Then, with a brief apology to Mrs. Oppelson, the inspector set to work to ransack the room. He pulled out drawers, opened cupboards, completely unmade the bed, and tapped the floor. Mr. Oppelson looked on sceptically. <laughs> you really think you'll find them? 
Yes, sir. It stands to reason. She hadn't time to take them out of the room. The ladies discovering the robbery so soon upset her plans. No, they're here right enough. One of the two must have hidden them, and it's very unlikely for the chambermaid to have done so. Oh, more than unlikely. Impossible, said Poirot quietly. Eh? The inspector stared. Poirot smiled modestly. I will demonstrate. Hastings, my good friend, take my watch in your hand. Uh, with care. It is a family heirloom. <sighs> no, just now I timed Mademoiselle's movements. Her first absence from the room was of twelve seconds. Her second, of fifteen. Now, observe my actions. Madame will have the kindness to give me the key of the jewel case. Hmm? I thank you. My friend Estings will have the kindness to say, go. <clears throat> go, I said. With almost incredible swiftness, Poirot wrenched open the drawer of the dressing table, extracted the jewel case, fitted the key in the lock, opened the case, selected a piece of jewellery, shut and locked the case, and returned it to the drawer, which he pushed to again. His movements were like lightning. Well, mon ami, he demanded of me breathlessly. Forty-six seconds, I replied. Ah, you see, he looked around. There would have not been time for the chambermaid even to take the necklace out, far less hide it. Well, that settles it on the maid, said the inspector with satisfaction, and returned to his search. He passed into the maid's bedroom next door. Poirot was frowning thoughtfully. Suddenly he shot a question at Mr. Oppelson. And this necklace, it was without doubt insured? Mr. Oppelson looked a trifle surprised at the question. Uh, yes, he said hesitatingly. That is so. Oh, but what does that matter? broke in Mrs. Oppelson tearfully. It's my necklace I want. It was unique. No money could be the same. Oh, I comprehend, madame, said Poirot soothingly. I comprehend perfectly. Eh? To la femme, sentiment is everything. Is it not so? But, monsieur... Who has not the so fine susceptibility will doubtless find some slight consolation in the fact. <laughs> well, of course, of course, said Mr. Oppelson rather uncertainly. Still, um... he was interrupted by a shout of triumph from the inspector. He came in dangling something from his fingers. With a cry, Mrs. Oppelson heaved herself up from her chair. She was a changed woman. Oh, oh, my necklace! She clasped it to her breast with both hands. We crowded round. Well, where was it? demanded Oppelson. Maid's bed, in among the springs of the wire mattress. Oh, she must have stolen it and hidden it there before the chambermaid arrived on the scene. Uh, you permit, madame? said Poirot gently. He took the necklace from her and examined it closely, then handed it back with a bow. I'm afraid... Madame, uh, you'll have to hand it over to us for the time being, said the inspector. We shall want it for the charge, but it shall be returned to you as soon as possible. Mr. Oppelson frowned. Uh, is that necessary? I'm afraid so, sir. Just a formality. Oh, let him take it, Ed, cried his wife. I'd feel safer if he did. I shouldn't sleep a wink thinking someone else might try to get hold of it. Oh, that wretched girl! And I would never have believed it of her. Ah, oh, there, there, my dear. Don't take on so. I felt a gentle pressure on my arm. It was Poirot. Uh, shall we slip away, my friend? I think our services are no longer needed. Eh? Once outside, however, he hesitated, and then, much to my surprise, he remarked, I should rather like to see the room next door. The door from the corridor was not locked, and we entered. The room, which was a large double one, was unoccupied. Dust lay about rather noticeably, and my sensitive friend gave a characteristic grimace as he ran his finger round a rectangular mark on a table near the window. The service leaves to be desired, he observed dryly. He was staring thoughtfully out of the window and seemed to have fallen into a brown study. Well, 
I demanded impatiently. What did we come in here for? He started. Ah, oh, je vous demande pardon, mon ami. I wish to see if the door was really bolted on this side also. Well, I said, glancing at the door which communicated with the room we had just left. It is bolted. Poirot nodded. He still seemed to be thinking. And anyway, I continued, what does it matter? The case is over. Ah, I wish you'd had more chance of distinguishing yourself. But it was the kind of case that even a stiff-backed idiot like that inspector couldn't go wrong over. Poirot shook his head. The case is not over, my friend. It will not be over until we find out who stole the pearls. But the maid did. Why do you say that? Why? I stammered. Well, they were found, actually, in her mattress. Ah, da, 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 said Poirot impatiently. Those were not the pearls. What? Imitation, mon ami. The statement took my breath away. Poirot was smiling placidly. The good inspector obviously knows nothing of jewels, but presently there will be a fine hullabaloo. Come, I cried, dragging at his arm. Where? What, well, we must tell the Oppelsons at once. Oh, I think not. But that poor woman. Eh bien, that poor woman, as you call her, will have a much better night believing the jewels to be safe. Yeah, but the thief may escape with them. As usual, my friend, you speak without reflection. How do you know that the pearls, Mrs. Opperson, locked up so carefully tonight, were not the false ones, eh? and that the real robbery did not take place at a much earlier date? Oh, I said, bewildered. Exactly, said Poirot, beaming. We start again. He led the way out of the room, paused a moment as though considering, and then walked down to the end of the corridor, stopping outside the small den where the chambermaids and valets of the respective floors congregated. Our particular chambermaid appeared to be holding a small court there, and to be retailing her late experiences to an appreciative audience. She stopped in the middle of a sentence. Poirot bowed with his usual politeness. Uh, excuse that I derange you, huh? but I shall be obliged if you will unlock for me the door of Mr. Oppelson's room. The woman rose willingly, and we accompanied her down the passage again. Mr. Oppelson's room was on the other side of the corridor, its door facing that of his wife's room. The chambermaid unlocked it with her passkey, and we entered. As she was about to depart, Poirot detained her. Uh, one moment. Have you ever seen among the effects of Mr. Oppelson a card like this? He held out a plain white card, rather highly glazed and uncommon in appearance. The maid took it and scrutinized it carefully. No, oh, no, sir, I can't say I have. But anyway, the valet has most to do with the gentleman's rooms. Oh, I see. Thank you. Poirot took back the card. The woman departed. Poirot appeared to reflect a little. Then he gave a short, sharp nod of the head. Uh, ring the bell, I pray of you, Hastings, three times for the valet. I obeyed, devoured with curiosity. Meanwhile, Poirot had emptied the waste paper basket on the floor and was swiftly going through its contents. In a few moments, the valet answered the bell. To him, Poirot put the same question and handed him the card to examine. But the response was the same. The valet had never seen a card of that particular quality among Mr. Oppelson's belongings. Poirot thanked him, and he withdrew, somewhat unwillingly with an inquisitive glance at the overturned waste-paper basket and the litter on the floor. He could hardly have helped overhearing Poirot's thoughtful remark as he bundled the torn papers back again. <sighs> and the necklace was heavily unsure, then. Poirot! I cried. I see! No, you see nothing, my friend, he replied quickly. As usual, nothing at all. It is incredible, but there it is. Ah, let us return to our own apartments. We did so in silence. Once there, to my intense surprise, Poirot effected a rapid change of clothing. I go to London tonight, he explained. It is imperative. What? 
No, absolutely. The real work, that of the brain. Ah, those brave little grey cells. It is done. I go to seek the confirmation. I shall find it. Impossible to deceive. Hercule Poirot. You'll come a cropper one of these days, I observed, rather disgusted by his vanity. Oh, do not be enraged, I beg of you, mon ami. I count on you to do me a service of your friendship. Oh, of course, I said eagerly, rather ashamed of my moroseness. What is it? The sleeve of my coat that I have taken off, will you brush it? You see, you, a little white powder has clung to it. You, without doubt, observed me run my finger around the drawer of the dressing table. Uh, no, I didn't. Ah, oh, you should observe my actions, my friend. Thus, I obtained the powder on my finger, and being a little overexcited, I rubbed it on my sleeve. <laughs> An action without method, which I deplore, false to all my principles. But what was the powder? I asked, not particularly interested in Poirot's principles. Well, not the poison of the bourgeois, replied Poirot with a twinkle. I see your imagination mounting. Eh? I should say it was French chalk. Well, French chalk? Yes. A cabinet makers use it to make drawers run smoothly. I laughed. <laughs> you old sinner! I thought you were working up to something exciting. <laughs> Au revoir, my friend. I save myself. <laughs> I fly. The door shut behind him. With a smile, half of derision, half of affection, I picked up the coat and stretched out my hand for the clothes brush. The next morning, hearing nothing from Poirot, I went out for a stroll, met some old friends, and lunched with them at their hotel. In the afternoon we went for a spin. A punctured tyre delayed us and it was past eight when I got back to the Grand Metropolitan. The first sight that met my eyes was Poirot, looking even more diminutive than usual, sandwiched between the Oppelsons, beaming in a state of placid satisfaction. Ah, mon ami, as things, he cried, and sprang to meet me. Embrace me, my friend. All has marched to a marvel. Luckily, the embrace was merely figurative, not a thing one is always sure of with Poirot. Do you mean... I began. Oh, just wonderful, I call it, said Mrs. Oppelson, smiling all over her fat face. Didn't I tell you, Ed, that if he couldn't get back my pearls, nobody would? Uh, you, you did, my dear, you did, and you were right. I looked helplessly at Poirot, and he answered the glance. My friend, as things is, as you say in England, all at the seaside, <laughs> Seat yourself, and I will recount to you all the affair that has so happily ended. Ended? Oh, but yes, they are arrested. Hmm? Well, who are arrested? The chambermaid and the valet, parbleu. You did not suspect, eh? not with my parting hint about the French joke? Well, you said cabinet makers used it. Eh? But certainly they do, to make drawers slide easily. Somebody wanted a drawer to slide in and out without any noise. Who could that be? Eh? Obviously, only the chambermaid. The plan was so ingenious that it did not at once leap to the eye, not even to the eye of Hercule Poirot. Now listen, this was how it was done. The valet was in the empty room next door, waiting. The French maid leaves the room. Quick as a flash... The chambermaid whips open the drawer, takes out the jewel case, and, slipping back the bolt, passes it through the door. The valet opens it at his leisure with the duplicate key with which he has provided himself, extracts the necklace, and waits his time. Celestine leaves the room again, and, psst, in a flash, the case is passed back again and replaced in the drawer. Madame arrives. The theft is discovered. The chambermaid demands to be searched with a good deal of righteous indignation, eh? and leaves the room without a stain on her character. The imitation necklace with which they have provided themselves has been concealed in the French girl's bed that morning by the chambermaid. Uh -huh. A master stroke, sir. But what did you go to London for? You remember the card? Certainly. 
It puzzled me. Well, it puzzles me still. I thought... Well, I... I hesitated delicately, glancing at Mr. Oppleson. Poirot laughed heartily. <laughs> Une blague for the benefit of the valet. The card was one with a specially prepared surface eh, for fingerprints. I went straight to Scotland Yard, asked for our old friend Inspector Jap, and laid the facts before him. As I had suspected, the fingerprints proved to be those of two well-known jewel thieves who had been wanted for some time. Jap came down with me. The thieves were arrested, and the necklace was discovered in the valet's possession. Ah, a clever pair, but they failed in method. Have I not told you, Hastings, at least thirty-six times that without method... At least thirty-six thousand times, I interrupted. But where did their method break down? Mon ami, it is a good plan to take a place as chambermaid or valet. Hmm? But you must not shirk your work. They left an empty room undusted, and therefore, when the man put down the jewel case on the little table near the communicating door, it left a square mark. Huh? But I remember, I cried. Before... I was undecided. Then I knew. There was a moment's silence. And I've got my pearls, said Mrs. Oppleson as a sort of Greek chorus. Well, I said, I had better have some dinner. Poirot accompanied me. Well, this ought to mean kudos for you, I observed. Oh, pas de tout, replied Poirot tranquilly. Jap and the local inspector will divide the credit between them, eh? but, he tapped his pocket, I have a check here from Mr. Upperson and, how you say, my friend, this weekend has not gone according to plan. Eh? Shall we return here next weekend at my expense this time? <laughs>